uploaded a new video for Tower of God Season 2 Cut content. This is from episodes 1 to 3 in a nice batch. Let's see what he has to say. Unlike how you may have expected to keep- Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Here we season go. Season 2 picks up five years after the events of Season 1. Unlike how you may have expected to keep up with the cast from last season, though, Season 2 brings us a completely new one. Mm -hmm. It's a brand new setting with a brand new set of characters, and the only common element between them are the tests carried out. Bam. <laughs> it's Veal now. I don't know how people feel about the new roster of characters. Obviously, Tower of God actual readers are going to be able to appreciate them because they probably know how they'll develop later on to the story, but... You know, remember what happened to Skimmy Shimmy with Fantasy Season 2 in the beginning? People are complaining because the perspective changed into other characters that's not Makoto in the game. And some people might have even thought about dropping. But I think that because Viola is still here, you know? It's not like Makoto is completely gone in this specific example, right? Because Viola is still here, I think people are fine with it. He does return as the series' focal point, but he's not the main character like how he was last season. No. Season 2 tells the story of lots of different characters. It's a season that portrays more of the middle class regulars, all while having their plots... I don't know why it's funny when he calls these middle class regulars, like the working class, middle class, lower class, upper class. All while having their plots intertwine with BAMs. It's for this reason that getting to know them is extremely important, since their impact later on might not be as minimal as you might think. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, I was drinking something. What the fuck is this picture? Why is there a girl saying, come back again to AK and Horyang? Why is AK just in boxer briefs? What happened? Why are they all sparkling? Is that a massage they got from the lady? What's, what's going on here, bro? What the? So, while the anime may not be able to show every scene with each of this massive cast of characters, this video and the ones to come certainly will. Nice. It's an in-depth look into what the anime left out from the manhwa. A comprehensive guide for those who haven't read the story themselves. Wow, love looks way better. You can see that the art has significantly changed since season 1 content that we've been seeing through the webtoon examples and season 2 content, huh? It, it's a it's a complete change here. Comprehensive guide for those who haven't read this story. Way themselves. better. I'm not sure yet how often I'll make these, but if you want to see more Tower of God content, then be sure to leave a like and let me know in the comments. Yep, we will. But anyway. But first, but first, but before we start, you think an ad's coming or what? I suppose you might need a recap yeah, no, 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 it, it's, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. No, 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 unless he's doing a recap just to pad watch time, which I doubt, I think he's doing this to then justify plugging uh, a webtoon service so that you can relive the moments of season one. That's the hook he's doing right now. On the way season one ended, so the gist is that Rachel bad. She watched Bam do- No? No ad? No ad? All right, I'm wrong. I thought he'd plug in a fucking webtoon sponsor everything she couldn't and that led to resentment since it was as if he took everything she wanted away from her. This led to her deal with Hedon, along with the subsequent move to push Bam out the bubble. A lengthy series of events orchestrated mostly by her. As a guide whose powers bordered- Was it orchestrated by Hwadyun? I thought it was... Yuhan Sung planning, and Hwadyun mostly kind of there as an assistant, kind of, you know, doing more of the groundwork as like a soldier. On near foresight, her task was to make Rachel the main character, a task she completed the moment Rachel pushed Bam out the bubble. This allowed her to move on to her next job, which was to take Bam and guide him up the tower a different way. Of course, there was so much more going on behind the scenes, but mm -hmm. the purpose of all this was to ensure the Jahard family thought Bam was dead. That was the main reason why- I will still call him Zahad because the anime pronounces it Zahad, but it is kind of- it's like, is it Jahard? Is it Zahard? Is the R silent? Is it a Z? Is it a J? It's all kind of ambiguous. ...or going on behind the scenes, but the purpose of all this was to ensure the Jahard family thought Bam was dead. That was the main reason why all this happened, and the next steps are what's coming together now in Season 2. Okay. So, fast forward five years after the events of Season 1, and that brings us to the opening scene with Yuri. A place formerly known as Jahard's fifth floating castle and fifth. the resident palace. I love how it's the fifth floating castle. So he has minimum four more, and this could possibly be not the last one either. And the resident palace of Repolista Jahard. Repolista. The butler is Repolista's the guide. Princesses. And his name is Alamic Edrock. 
The princess after is Kun Masheni Jahard, and she's the owner of the Yellow May. Masheni has the Yellow May. I need to see more of the princess 13 month series. If her hair wasn't enough to give it away, then knowing her name should make it clear that she's related to this Kun. Yeah, as soon as you see, you know, the hair color like this, it's all blue turtle people. Not fully since they're. Also, Shiroi, thank you for the tier one sub. I didn't see that shit before. Thank you for the four months, man. Their mothers are different, but they are half siblings since their father is the same. Her age isn't something we're given, but if she's old enough to mock Yuri for being too young, Ancient. then it's likely her age is well into the thousands. Ancients, bro. In any case, we saw Yuri wanting to know the truth about Bam, but the reason isn't just because he earned her respect. She was actually a lot more desperate than how the anime portrayed her, and the reason for that is because of, well, this. She seems to be quite a <laughs> super handsome. Yeah, he just she's just super down bad for bomb. From the beginning. This this she's a groomer, bro. Hot take. Yuri is an overrated girl in Tower of God. And she's a groomer. Yep, I said it. You gonna get mad? I'm right. It obsessed in more ways than one. This was enough to get Repelista to help her, but the return of the prince meant she couldn't leave her room either. Whatever way she's involved in the events to come, it's implied that it's something she needs to be actively present for. That's weird, okay. Repelista is condition is she cannot leave this room until presumably Wangnan, who is the Prince of Zahad. It's not confirmed, but every you know evidence that we've gotten so far points to that direction. He will return to the fifth floating castle one of these days. I don't believe that it's gonna happen in season two or season three or season four. I feel like this kind of shit is like super, 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 super end game, bro. If you think of it in like one, one Piece context, I feel like we're still in the fucking East Blue, bro. And like, this is some new world shit. Implied that it's something she needs to be actively present for. Both her and her impressive array of lighthouses. Now, floor 20 is- I like this new thing, uh, uh, Aninius is doing by anytime he says like a jargon, like a guide, I think he said before, little pop up shows up, and instead of him having to explain what that jargon is, we can read, right? A cube shaped device used by light bearers to gather information, do complex. Basically, it's just a fucking computer. Now, floor 20 is where the main story really begins, and the majority of the floor is a massive floating castle itself. It's this giant hub bearing the symbol of the great family that owns it, shaped like the hull of a ship as if to continue with the ocean theme. Yep. Passing here meant you became an officially ranked E-class regular, and along with it came- <laughs> That's so sad. We're still so trash that passing the 20th floor finally makes you E-rank. Just like the scaling of the letters right now is so painfully fucking slow. We're trying to become E-rank right now. Oh my god. In quite the array of benefits. To actually pass was a whole different story on its own though, so that's what the first four episodes pretty much focus on. To start things off with episode one, the beginning introduces this new setting fairly accurately. Our new protagonist is clearly established and we're quickly brought up to speed with the type of situation Lurker. he's in. Where we really learn quite a bit more. <laughs> no, Nia! I don't actually feel that bad about Nia, I barely knew him. The really sad shit was him eating sweet and sour pork alone, though. Oh, that kind of hit me hard. About him is through the conversation he had here with Nia. You see, it was when asking about why Nia wasn't taking the tests that Wangnan would make his own assumptions first. This was actually him just projecting his own circumstances, and hmm. it's through that that we learn why he continues to take the tests himself. As it turns out, despite the hard tests, the steep price, and the overpowered competitors from the Ten Great Families, Climbing the tower wasn't a dream that he could give up on. It didn't matter how little of a chance he thought he had, because to him he felt he needed to try as much as possible. Why? And that's the thing that I want to know. Why is he climbing the tower? Well, to change the way... He pretty much said it at the end, right? At the end of this arc, in front of the bomb, he said, I want to change this tower because the way that everything is run is fucked up, right? He's going to basically become king of the tower. But, like, he hasn't really ever said or ever monologue that he is the prince, right? There's never been a situation where he himself was talking in the perspective of a Zahad prince. And obviously the author is being very careful with that. And I'm like, why? Why are you showing me every evidence so far that he probably is the prince, yet you don't even make, you don't have any dialogue confirming that he is the prince. And rather, you have another purple-haired kid whose name is literally Prince. 
Sure, he could call life unfair and blame everything around him, but if he wanted to find out who he really was, pursuing his dreams was the only way to do that. There was this true sense of conviction to find the real him. The ring. One that undoubtedly relates to his position as prince. Yeah. <laughs> it's when we move on now to the 30 minute survival test that more of the main cast is introduced to us. There's Bam moonlighting as Viole. Hot take. Mising and Gosang are useless and just eat up screen time that could be given to AK and Horyang and Wang Nan. Yo, I'm gonna say it. You gonna be mad? You gonna cry? And your favorite character is Mising and Gosang, bro? What the fuck do they do? They make AK look good. <laughs> it does. It, it makes. No, no, no. The, 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 the daughter girl is supposed to be like, you know, AK is like dad virgin kind of came out and made him look good. And the glasses girl, suddenly Horyang and her, there's like a, I think a love romance ship building between them, right? They're not useless characters, but it's a like, what can they really do? You know, they haven't done shit yet. There's Bam moonlighting as Viole, Kang the massive teddy bear, Misang, Gosang, then Arc Raptor. AK! I know his name is Arc Raptor, but because his name showed up with AK Raptor, I think it's fun to just call him AK rather than Ak Raptor or Arc Raptor. Much of their introductions need no elaboration, but mm -hmm. if you're wondering the relationship between Miseng and Goseng, the author confirmed they're something akin to cousins, not oh. siblings. Okay. Now, Wang Nan's outburst was a lot more abrasive in the manhwa since he really digs deep into the whole abandonment idea. He essentially called Miseng complacent and useless, which could very well just be him projecting his own issues again. Either way, we now know how it is a childlike <laughs> just shit on a kid for losing their parents. Her got here. It's an occurrence that's more common than you might think. Arc Raptor's problem next wasn't so much directed at Miseng and Goseng specifically, but was rather just an issue with having too many survivors. You see, if the next test had all of them competing against each other, then it makes sense to want less people to fight against. True. That's why he decided to do a vote, since the alternative to him would, in his own words, involve bloodshed. From the beginning, he was so reasonable. I thought that he would be a menace for whatever reason, but he didn't even become the menace in that episode. It was just bomb. AK is breath of fresh air. He is the mature, reasonable adult in the room. A lot of people kind of like, I don't know, he's, he, he gets kind of like the butt of the joke too here and there, but like, I think AK is such a good character so far. It was far better to vote than to work things out by fighting. This does tie into Arc Raptor's character development later, but for now, all you need to know is how it works to define who he is right now. That was the point of showing each character one by one as the Manwa equivalent intended solely to introduce everyone. The author wanted to show the difference between this cast and Season 1's cast, yep. since if Season 1 represented the upper class members of the tower, <laughs> Season 2 is then more to showcase the middle class. <laughs> Again, this, or, when you say upper and middle class, are you actually talking about like the socioeconomic hierarchy? Like, you know, the, 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 the basically, our, you know, we, the Season 1 characters, they're lit. Yo, they're cracked, bro. We know them. We've seen them. They're insane, bro. And now they're living in the nice pearly gates beyond the 20th floor, bro. They're, they're, they're upper class as fuck bougie, bro. Homeowners and shit. Multiple cars, multiple vacations a year. And then what? These dudes are just fucking trash middle class? Like, it's, it's very, um, what's the word? I respect this play. That you are committing so hard to introducing a brand new roster of characters. When the roster of characters already is so diverse. You're adding in more characters right now? I mean, you kind of have to, I guess, because we're separated, but to do this and to hopefully flourish, I'm sure SIU has a plan, but it's like, God damn it, you're juggling a lot of balls right now. To showcase the middle class. That's not to say this middle class doesn't have incredible potential on their own, but when compared to Endorsey's strength or Kun's yeah. brains, it's important to know they can't really be compared. Like, I love Horyang. You know, Devil of the Right Arm was sick, AK sick. You know, we got Wang Nan, we got Nepo Kid Prince, Misen Gozeng, well, but like, can they really compare to Blue Turtle exactly? We got two princesses of Hods, we got fucking Shibisu, the god brain himself, bro. We, we got, and, 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 and like, it, 
they can't be compared. That that's why they pro progress beyond the twentieth floor, and the shooters we're working with right now are barely trying to become E rank. There's a huge difference between the power of the ten great families. Nah, I'm not still buying it. This young girl, bro, I'm still not buying it. No, I hear that she's way better in the webtoon. The way that she's portrayed in the anime is just a bitch. But, and like a, like a, like a stupid one too. But I, I hear in the webtoon, she's not like that. And everyone else. Bam's reveal introduces his affiliation to Bug, which, as Misang said, is the most influential crime syndicate in the tower. Yeah, and they literally wear clothing, bro. It's like Crips and Bloods. Having like blue or red bandanas, literally flexing in public, almost being like territorial, being like, yep, we're this organization, you wanna fuck with us? They're the organization that set itself against the 10 great families. A group known to be so incredibly powerful- Sorry, wait, 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 what? I thought the fuck was mainly anti-King Zahad, but any you said against 10 great families? They're the organization that set itself against the 10 great families. Because the Ten Great Families is directly in support of King Zahad? A group known to be so incredibly powerful that the odds of one being here now just didn't make sense to anyone. That doubt didn't last for very long though, because when a random test taker walked through the door during all the commotion, uh -oh. Bam immediately laid him out and eliminated him in front of everyone. <laughs> you gotta look at a character's design and think, is the character's design actually good? If it's not, they might be just cannon fodder, right? An author has to realize it's like, alright, I gotta make a new dude that's gonna get dumpstered by Bam right now. How much effort am I gonna put in for this new character? Not that much, I guess. During all the commotion, <laughs> Bam immediately laid him out and eliminated him in front of everyone. It was a cutscene that not only highlighted his power, but at the same time served as the motivation to get the others to team up. The fight then continues pretty much as we saw, with the exception of a minor detail adding to the ambiguity behind whatever this was. Yeah! <laughs> what was this? Wang Nan threw a bunch of Pokeballs. It worked really well. It was super effective. But that was also because we had a little bit of a uh, hesitation while thinking about Rachel, which I think put Bomb's like guard down. And then I assume that this is like a last stand kind of thing where you took a lethal hit and insurance came out and it's fucking uh, Susano. This was. You see, Wangnan had already been tossing his bombs at Bomb before. He had used the strongest ones in his inventory, yet not a single one seemed to affect him. That left only his cheap gum bombs, which to him were nothing gum more than bombs. a futile last effort. They were so weak that he didn't actually think they were gonna do anything. That's why he was so shocked when they actually did, since to see him tank all those crazy attacks before, it didn't make sense why these would work. It was a situation made even more confusing by the appearance of what the author describes as what lobster. What is? Lobster? Obviously that's not actually. Uh, yeah, I could see it. I could see like the shell of a lobster over here. Everything's trying to be like, you know, ocean, you know, seafood theme here anyways. Actually what it is, but lobster armor. it's the author's way of incorporating shonen elements. Okay, so basically, you know, like the inner beast coming out, right? Like when Naruto is in like a lethal situation, you know, the QB, you know, chakra comes out. You, know, you see the tails and shit, right? The imagery, right? So, the lobster comes out from Bomb? This whole sequence of action was intended to make it feel as such. That's not to say Tower of God is a shonen through and through though, since the author likes to make it feel like a whole lot of different genres. He wants it to feel like something more mature than that, since the problems presented are associated more with people in their 20s. Yeah, I think it's gonna- I'm not sure if it's correct to call it a seinen. But there's like shonen, which is for young boys, and seinen, which is for like more mature people, right? Nothing bad with having battle shonen elements in it, though. Not their teens. This was actually why he made Season 2 start on the 20th floor, and it's the reason we see our new protagonist deal with problems like crippling debt. Yeah, like shit like this is very relatable to a lot of the people in their 20s, right? Just like having debt and trying to work your way out of a fucking sinking debt hole and you feel like you're fucking stuck and every day you're just fucking working and can't get, you know, past... You can't have any sort of social mobility. It is extremely fucking relatable rather than being like a 12 year old watching fucking Naruto. Crippling debt. This brings us now to episode 2 where in between this bit of relaxation, another regular is shown to arrive oh, with quite a- full on nipple showing as well. Who is this guy? A different story. His circumstances were very much the same as Wang Nun's, but the group he was in was a lot more hostile. So much so that he could barely walk after. 
It was only a matter of time then before he would collapse, and it was in that moment that he would start to beg. A uh -oh. cry for help that would get Go Seng to react. Unfortunately, Wang Nan would convince her not to, since to do so now would just mean having to go against him later. It was common sense and the only move to make right now. Fast forward to the introduction of Yun, Prince. and her situation was just the byproduct of poor power control. She had failed her test because she had burned everyone, including her teammates. <laughs> yeah, and they all died apparently, but Wang Nan didn't die. Leading her to this position as a helper to Prince. This we already know from what they showed in the anime, but what you may not know is how Test 2 is an idea borrowed from Dragon Ball's Tenchi Bukai test. Tenkaichi Budokai. But he says, I think this is a reference to Budokai Tenkaichi. It has to be. I, I think Tenchi Bukai is probably just like, you know, getting rid of the middle uh, syllables to make it a little bit more, I don't know, concise. Just like how the Shinsu like an acronym. test was a shonen classic. So too was this a common yeah. staple the author wanted to implement in his story. Everyone loves shit like this. Everybody has a soft spot for entrance exam arcs or stuff like this where people are gauging their powers in a room of strong individuals and everyone's thinking, oh, who's this guy? You know, who's the strongest guy here? I love Battle Shonen shit like this. It was a test he chose purely because he thought it would be fun. Also because all the previous tests have always been so complicated. Yeah. Since a big brain like Kun starts to trivialize a lot of the simpler tests, you need the games to be more complex to highlight his true potential. This was what SIU meant- So you're saying there's no one fucking smart in her current roster of middle class rankers? So we just gave him a bunch of Oonga Boonga tests? ...mentioned is the biggest difference between seasons 1 and 2. Yeah, no Blue Turtle simpler games, which... Honestly, I am low-key a fan of... I don't know. I don't know. I think that I'm getting spoiled with a lot of these tests being so unique and being complex and having different restrictions and rule sets that makes it not a direct 1v1, but a lot more complex and interesting. And it definitely highlights some of the other characters that are not just strong in one way, you know? But at the same time, it's like, fuck, there's so many things to remember and memorize. Sometimes I just want to see 1v1 Oonga Boonga just happen, you know what I mean? Now, the test proceeded exactly as we saw, all the way up to when Bam went. Though not mentioned in the anime, the move he used was a special ability called Flare Wave Explosion. An incredibly strong Shinsu technique which made it clear he most definitely was Fug. Yeah. I won't get too deep into how it works right now, but the basic idea is that it uses reverse flow control to transfer the shock of Shinsu from one's body to a target. Reverse flow control, Shinsu goes out, sure. I'm surprised that they're still not bringing in that mechanic of Shinsu that was so important. The term known as... Bang, which roughly translates to one room, which is like if you have multiple bangs, then you can have more Shinsu attacks coming in in parallel. But they're still not really talking about that. I don't fully understand how it works myself, but from what I've read, it's apparently a very dangerous skill. One that only members of Bug are said to have mastered. It just looks like Shinsu attacks. I don't know. Is it supposed to be super complicated? I just saw it and it just felt intuitive that, okay, Bomb is like shooting a Shinsu beam. And here Bomb is imbuing Shinsu into his hands to do martial arts close combat. This was why Love was so visibly shocked since Bam's presence was a sign of disrespect to everything the tower stood for. Hmm. He's a living representation of straight up rebellion. So, Love changing the criteria. It's like manipulating the Shinsu inside someone. Think bloodbending. I don't know what bloodbending is, but if we're going to talk in terms of waterbending and shit like that, I'm going to assume that someone can control blood in someone's body. So it's basically controlling Shinsu. Yeah, but you're controlling Shinsu in someone's body. At the end of the day, it's just a Shinsu fucking beam, but done in a way that might be really fucking hard to regular people in this world, I guess. Tyria to pass seemed to me like his own way of fighting back. By forcing Bam to choose team- Oh yeah, the score was uh, 130 mil, right? What did Bam get? 130,000 points? Every point system, the previous person was doubling. And then we got 130. And Love got 13.2 million. Not 130. 13.2 million, that's right. Teammates to go along with him. Back to was effectively having him abide by the rules of the tower. Not whatever rules him or Fug had created. This led to the ridiculous outburst from Wang Nan and the others, followed by an even more ridiculous argument between him and Yan. 
She was describing herself as this powerful fisherman, but her inability to control her flames wasn't something to be overlooked. It was a sore point Wang Nan kept hammering home over and over again. Eventually, this led Yan to explode, and with it came- I have bigger breasts, you smelly male monkey. Bigger breasts than who? Who are you comparing yourself to, Wang Nan? Of course you're going to! You're the monkey! A comment you probably wouldn't expect from her. It was a comical response that- <laughs> I see, we're comparing his balls. If he's whipping out- If he's whipping out his wang right now. If Wang Nan is ripping out his wang. <laughs> Just the comparison- What are you- Why are you comparing the size of your balls with the size of her breast? What the fuck? Wang Nan was more than ready to counter. That's when Bam would say he wasn't going to bring anyone, which to love wasn't something he was so willing to accept. Reason being that it didn't matter who Bam thought he was because the rules of the exam weren't to be changed for anyone. That was what love mentioned to be an absolute rule of the tower. It also wasn't fair to any of the other regulars either since most if not all were willing to do anything to pass. It wasn't Bam's right to be able to deny them from that. Now. The end of episode oh, 2 is where goodness. we learn a bit more about Yan, specifically on how she feels about the standards she needs to live up to and her subsequent plan to befriend Bam then kill him after. <laughs> yeah, you think that you- ugh, So many fucking backstabbers, bro. So many goddamn betrayals in this goddamn tower of god. Tower betrayals, bro. She couldn't just team up with him without consequence, so in order to reprove herself after a disgrace like that, she figured the only way to do so was to kill him. Okay, good so luck. This brings us to that awkward befriending part where it does highlight some of Yon's accomplishments. In addition to getting some of the highest scores, there was no dismissing the fact- Was it some of the highest scores? I swear, like, a bunch of dudes showed up after and just, like, surpassed all her scores. And made well, if it's 22 kid, the next one was, like, 40-something. Then it's gonna be like 80 something or 70 something, then it's gonna be like bomb score. So I guess, yeah, yeah, no, she was. She was top 8 though. Of course, there was no dismiss. Prince was better, right? Prince was better, right? That's the fucked up thing. Like, how the fuck is Prince better? Why is Prince better? I don't get it. Like, this Nepo kid is actually talented. That pisses me off. But at the same time, he's like kind of joining our team now because he doesn't have his faction anymore he got betrayed by them so now he's kind of just got, got to be on his like best action and cling on to our team but i don't trust him it's gonna be weird there was no dismissing the fact that she had climbed to floor 20 all by and yeah she she did slip apparently but some other people are saying like the score that you get on this is not proportional to how strong you hit it but rather the innate shins that you had i don't know bro i don't fucking know what is correct by herself she didn't use her family or anyone else, but instead did things solo and did so in less than the time that it took Bam to. It was a pretty amazing feat regardless of who you were. This brings us now to a completely cut out bath scene, which for the most part developed- <laughs> Why is it a bunch of dudes, bro? <laughs> this is the scene where AK and uh, Horyang was coming out with the girl, right? At the door. But it's just a bunch of dudes fucking doing this shit. Horyang also, I mean, he's not completely naked. He's got like boxers on, but like, what is this? Cause like, Horyang is clearly not a regular human. What, what is he? Like, I, it's hard to tell. What, is he wearing clothes right now? I don't know. Is, is his skin just purely black underneath? I don't know. Brings us now to a completely cut out bath scene, which for the most part developed a lot of the new characters. Arcraptor and Kang didn't see any problem with being- Like, what is Horyang wearing? What is this shit? Is he a cyborg? I could see that maybe. Like, well, I, this is clearly not just regular human shit. Being seen as anti Jihad, so even if they did end up joining with Bam, it wasn't a situation they were particularly worried about. Kang then questioned whether Ark Raptor actually had a daughter or not, he to does. which the answer was obvious considering how he treated Misang. Though it looked as if he was trying to get her to fail, to Kang it seemed like he was more so just trying to prevent her from getting hurt. It was subtle behavior which one could only assume comes from someone who did have a daughter. Yep. Ark Raptor never did answer Kang's question, but he did respond with a question of his own. There's a ship a there. A simple inquiry confirming he was into Gosang. Mm -hmm. It was after this that the two would make yeah. their way to the open deck. Yeah, this, this scene. <laughs> kind of sad they cut that shit out. Slice of Life moments like that really does hammer in 
like how much more you're gonna like those characters, right? Slice of life moments. Once you've introduced a roster of characters and you start to kind of care about them, you introduce a funny moment like this, then you you start to really care about them more. Bath, where they would then discuss the next test with Wang Nan and Nia, a simple conversation, not particularly important, up until Prince's arrival a little bit <laughs> after. It seemed everyone else was avoiding Bam, but gang. for someone like Prince, he saw it more as a challenge. You see. He wanted to show he wasn't afraid of Bug and even let Bam know he wasn't gonna lose to him. <laughs> oh yes, Veal, actually I don't really like you. I don't like your attitude being so cocky just because you scored high in that lame test. Loser, now you have to fucking get on your knees and just slobber on that corn and hope to God that we're gonna let you come with us, bro, because you ain't got no more friends anymore. It was a bold move Baum unfortunately couldn't be bothered by since the only attention he gave was a very brief amount to Rap Devil. The devil's right arm who supposedly beat Hats. False though. He's a fraud. The real devil is Horion. Doesn't mean that Rap Devil's a fake though. I don't know. Maybe they're like the similar kinds. I don't fucking know what this right arm of the devil shit is, but it is been told that Hats lost to this guy, which is unfortunate. So then you could say... Horyang better than Hats? Confirmed? That's confirmed, right? We don't know the circumstances that led up to Hats' defeat. There could have been some bullshit going on where Hats was not at full power. It was unfair. This was the only thing that actually intrigued Bam, and it made him seeing curious enough to say he was looking forward to seeing the devil. Who's the devil? It was a statement that went to ignore the arm? Hats completely. The core reason behind this interaction in episode 3. Prince had also stormed out the bath and tried to interrupt Bam here, then even followed him into the hallway and confronted him before the test. It led to a cut conversation between him and Jan, where the extent was her telling him how little she wanted to do with him. Yet another one of the many scenes in which Prince's ego was getting the better of him. <laughs> of course, only to be met with some very cold rejection. The main point for all, though, was to basically show how persistent and narcissistic he is. Yep. But anyway. Episode 3 starts off with yet another new character who's a high ranker going by the name High ranker, so it's a difference from just the regular ranker. A high ranker is a ranker in the top 1% of total rankers. So it's already hard to become a ranker, right? It's like of all the fucking regulars and shit, maybe 1% will become a ranker. I don't know if that statistic is correct. And then of that 1%, you have a 1% of the 1% who's the top 1% of the total rankers. Rankers being people who've reached Floor 134. Uh, and 134 is the final floor, right? Yeah. And like, it's like a seasonal thing, right? I think they explained in season one that like, rankings, rankers, just because like you climb to the top doesn't mean you're all equal. It's like, there's like people that do it faster and better. Name of Augustus. Augustus. He's the test director responsible for floor 20 and just like you, ensures the tests are running properly. What was that? Whoa, whoa. Just like you? The responsible name of Augustus. He's the test director responsible for floor 20, and yeah. just like you. Yep. Okay. I'm like, what was he? I saw a character show up for one second. I'm like, who's you? And I thought Beyblade for a second. No, 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 no. This is Tower of God. Yu Han Sung. Ensures the tests are running properly. Love is simply the administrator conducting the test, and his job is to at most oversee everything. Yeah. His bias towards Fug isn't supposed to change that, which is why Gus Gus needed to be so stern with him. Just because Love thinks Bam is evil doesn't mean he deserves unfair treatment apart from everyone else. This was the message Augustus was trying to send, but... Evil is such a vague term, we have to follow the rules, absolutely. If... If this line was shown to me in the earlier scenes, before we had that call, where, you know, they had that phone call, and Augustus, you know, revealed that, yes, Wang Nan has passed as Fug desires. I would have made the connection that this motherfucker is the same shit like Yu Han Sung, where they use these different rules and terms to make it seem like they're following the right path, but at the end of the day, what are they doing? Fucking smuggling in an irregular, right? Evil is such a regular, like a vague term, meaning like there's some flexibility, you know? It's like, who, who decides what's evil? You know, we gotta follow the rules, let's just let bomb pass. So like, they're all in on it together, right? Augustus is... Maybe not in Fug, but definitely working with Fug if he allowed Wang Nan to pass and report it directly, right? Unfortunately, Love was very adamant about saying no. Even more so to all Augustus's follow-up questions. Don't touch that boy, then why don't you join my family? Do you like me? No, no, no. In any case, 
There was a cutscene after where something popped up which made Love nervous, but the context for that isn't something we'll get till later. What? I suppose the next scene- What do you see? In Love's eyes, he sees a computer screen, but it's blank. I don't know. He saw something that's important. Till later. I suppose the next scene worth mentioning is the one where they're playing cards, since it's here there was actually a nice heartfelt moment between Ark Raptor and Misang. Aww. After having lost numerous times because of Kang's back symbols, Ark Raptor decided to play around. <laughs> Wait. Ho Young. <laughs> he can't hide. Because, like, you know his, like, shoulder thing, when it's, like, a shoe, it's, like, haste. You know, he goes fast. When it's a fist, it's, like, strong. And when he's playing card games, he has a hard time hiding his feelings, poker face. So he's, like... Basically saying, I'm gonna do this, call, 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 everyone can see it, so he sucks at card games. Ark Raptor decided to play around with Misang. Pretty it cute. It was a game she was at first hesitant to try, but got way more into the more she played. By the end, she was having quite a bit of fun, and she had totally forgotten how scary Ark Raptor initially was to her. It was a small bonding moment enough to make Ark Raptor smile. Now. It was this fun which led to an interesting scene after, since that comment Gosang made seemed to weigh heavily on all of them. Sure, it would be nice to live like they are now and forget about the tower completely, but each knew that that was something they couldn't do. They all had reasons for why they needed to keep on climbing. Unless we find out what Gosang's power actually is and if it's that good, I don't really see a future how she can climb with us. Like... She might be Serena that didn't quit, but like, what is her power? We haven't seen anything, right? We haven't seen anything Koseng or Misen can do. They just kind of exist, and I have a hard time believing they're going to be actually important moving forward. I don't know. They wouldn't be here taking these tests if they didn't. Goseng only realized this after, so she quickly apologized then went back to her own room. It was an impactful scene where not that many words were said, but a strong message was conveyed through the expressions of everyone. The message that climbing the tower trumped everything to them. This brings us now to the final test, which is a lot less confusing when you understand it as a simple race against man. Either he beats Love and secures his room for himself, or the other secures seven teammates in six rooms before that. I'll talk more about the specifics in the next video, but for now I hope this video added to your Tower of God watching experience. I just wish you would give us a weekly video like this every week so I can be lazy and farm this any news. But thank you so much. And that is today's cut content for episode 1 to 3. I know it's not complete. He's going to probably release more. Go to the video. Like the video. Sub to his channel if you haven't. And I'll see you all in the next one. Bye-bye.